What's up everyone? James here coming back at you with another video. And in this video, the Decepticons shall rise from defeat. I even wore my Decepticon tank in honor of this momentous occasion and in honor of our Lord, my boy, Soundwave leading the Decepticons. Now, what I want you guys to do before we get into this video, I want you to hit that like button then I want you to comment below, all hail Soundwave, Soundwave, Soundwave. Now follow that out of the way, let's get into it. Okay, so this opens with Carly taking Spike to this lake near Farmingham Hospital, thinking some fresh air will help with his recovery. What's sad here is that Carly asks Spike how he feels, and he answers he feels empty, and didn't realize how much he needed his dad until he was gone. That all he thinks about every time he sees the Transformers now is how he has no body or even ashes to bury his dad, just like his brother Jimmy. Cliffjumper offers Spike and Carly some colas, but Carly refuses to even look at him. Spike attempts to mend their relationship, pointing out to Carly that Cliffjumper saved her life, but she doesn't want to hear it. She tells Cliffjumper she doesn't want to speak to him because he had the power to end Starscream's reign of terror for good. That he killed so many innocent people, even his friend Bumblebee, and he still chose not to pull the trigger. Honestly, those are some of the same reasons why I particularly didn't like Climpjumper not killing Starscream. From here we go to Cybertron. Alita One is carrying Ultra Magnus, trying to escape Shockwave's tower, but she's having difficulty finding an exit. This is where we learn the depth of torture Magnus has endured. He tells Alita that he's been tortured by Shockwave over 150 years, day and night, and begs her to kill him. Alita apologizes for taking so long to save him, which is why she refuses to let him go now. However, if the Decepticons find them, she promises to Ultra Magnus that she will end both their sparks before they're captured. On Earth, in the Pacific Ocean, the USS Henry Harrison receives some company. Soundwave and his Decepticons strike. One interesting thing that happens here is Thundercracker grabs the ship's captain, and I thought he was about to pull a Starscream and squish him. However, he doesn't do that. He suddenly lets him go, because he pities how fragile humans are, and tells the captain and the crew to leave, allowing them to escape on the lifeboats. When Soundwave asks him, what are you doing? Dundercracker answers, they can't hurt us. This shows us that Dundercracker lives by his own warrior code, where it seems like he doesn't kill or fight those he doesn't consider an equal, which is refreshing honestly, to see within the Decepticons. Though Soundwave agrees with him, he responds, there can be no witnesses. Soundwave destroys the lifeboats, killing the entire crew. At the Ark, Wheeljack continues to have difficulty gaining access to Teletrans repair systems, because the remaining part of Skywarp Spark that's a part of it keeps blocking him out of the system. Optimus asks if he can separate Skywarp from it. Wheeljack answers he can't because the Decepticons hardwired Skywarp and Teletran together. Without Skywarp, Teletran ceases to function. Wheeljack realizes that this was probably Soundwave's failsafe plan in case they did take back the Ark. This shows Soundwave's strategic mind, and I love that, because you all know, that's my boy. Wheeljack pulls up the footage of what the Decepticons did to Skywarp. Although Wheeljack points out he's an enemy, Optimus feels sorry for Skywarp once he sees what they did to him. Suddenly, freaking Carly shows up with an RPG aimed at Skywarp, wanting him dead for good. Optimus tries to talk some sense to her, explaining how he understands Skywarp has done many terrible things, but they need him to heal the rest of the Autobots. Carly puts the rocket launcher down, but accidentally pulls the trigger and it fires. RC comes swooping in and puts herself in the rocket's trajectory and takes the hit. Now, whether because he is grateful to be saved or is just paying them back his way, Skywarp surprisingly fixes Wheeljack's legs. Optimus uses this mishap as a teaching moment for Carly, which she totally calls out and storms off. Moments later, RC follows Carly to her van, and Carly apologizes for her actions. She mentions to RC how she's confused about why the Autobots 
don't act like the powerful badass robots that they are. RC responds that they weren't always like that. Before the war on Cybertron, they were all scattered and lost until Optimus brought them together. That what Optimus desires most of all is peace, and the losses he's endured in pursuit of that could fill a chasm. Sometime later, as Optimus rests, he sees more of Sparky's memories. He awakens, still unsure of what's happening to him. He ends up checking up on the newly restored, or I guess you could say resurrected, Jetfire. However, what's sad about this is that Jetfire is legitimately blind and mode locked into his vehicle mode and is frightened by it all. He asks Optimus why he's in this state and why didn't he let him rest. Optimus answers that there was enough of his spark left to bring him back, but unfortunately they are low on Energon and having trouble with Teletrans repair systems, so they couldn't bring him back to his complete form. He wished he could have let him rest. However, because of their current situation in this war, they're in desperate need of transportation around the world so they can save it. Despite Optimus justifying why he's brought him back and being very apologetic about it all, Jetfire views it as Optimus seeing him as nothing but a resource to be used. When Optimus goes to leave because of how bad he feels over the situation, Jetfire pleads with him to stay because he doesn't want to feel alone in the darkness. Returning to the Decepticons, they have sunk the Henry Harrison, bringing it to the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Thundercracker asks Soundwave what they're doing, and I love his response and plan. He says Starscream had no vision, no plan, Thundercracker. His short-sightedness was only outpaced by his mindless need for violence. It is time we begin the long process of truly taking this rich planet for our own devices. We must use every resource at our disposal. The humans have their most advanced energy on this vessel, nuclear power. We will need it to awaken a vessel of our own. Soundwave had the Constructicons unearth the Decepticons ship, the Nemesis. When the Decepticons venture inside the ship to begin the repair process, they come across the ship's brig, where they have someone in prison. Now they assume this bot had escaped when the nemesis crashed, but that's not the case. They're still here and are trying to break their way out. Soundwave orders Thundercracker to unlock the brig, and who comes smashing their way out of it is Astro Train, who is very, very pissed off. He yells, where is he? He grips Thundercracker's face demanding an answer from Soundwave. When Soundwave answers, we do not know, Astro Train calls him a liar and throws Thundercracker against the wall and adds insult to injury by stomping his face in. He says, I will have the one who put me in prison. I will tear his fuel and drink Energon from his core. Soundwave makes it clear that he doesn't know. So Astro Train demands that he swears on his life that when they find the one that imprisoned him, he's all his. Soundwave responds, when we find him, I swear, Megatron will be yours to do with as you will. So it's clear to us that when Megatron returns, the Decepticons aren't going to be giving him a warm welcome. Back at the Ark, the Autobots detect the Decepticons' activation of the Nemesis. So Optimus orders the Autobots to board Jetfire. Carly insists on tagging along but Optimus tells her they can't be fighting the Decepticons and worrying about her safety at the same time, that she isn't a warrior. RC offers to make Carly her Iron Apprentice. When Carly asks what that is, RC explains that it is a sacred bond normally between two Cybertronians, one older and one younger. Now they will have that bond. She says it marks the beginning of a clan, what you call a family. It's what Ultra Magnus and I had long ago. Carly asks, where you go, I go, even into a fight? RC answers, that's right. Optimus orders both of them to stay with Wheeljack and defend the Ark and watch over Spike. Optimus and the rest of the Autobots roll out. I absolutely love the fact that Daniel Warren Johnson has introduced clans into Transformers lore and this Iron Apprentice bond that we've witnessed here. Back at the Nemesis, Soundwave says to Thundercracker, the Nemesis will never fly again. It's too big and needs too much energon. 
but we only need her antenna. It's time to call in reinforcements. Soundwave has contacted Shockwave. Let the Wave Bros reign of terror begin. That's the end of the video. I hope you all enjoyed it. Make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. Other than that, have an awesome day and always remember every day to go beyond.